This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Well, we are in a sermon series entitled Dear Church. Somebody say Dear Church. Um, in which we are taking an expository approach to the book of Galatians. Now, I love the book of Galatians because it talks about what the gospel is and what the gospel isn't. And Pastor Dean mentioned it in commun uh, communion, excuse me, that the gospel is not just about setting us free, causing us to live free, but it's also to help us stay free. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. In other words, the gospel's goal is to create a new life in Christ that looks completely different from our former life. Amen. Now, before the gospel, I was a real estate agent and a club promoter <laughs> amongst a bunch of other things that I'm just going to leave out. But when I heard about the good news of Jesus Christ, when, when, I, when, when the gospel, the engrafted seed, the word of God get, came into my heart and took residence in my life, it changed me from a former life to a new life. Now, am I the only person in here that got new life in Christ Jesus? We were all once something else. We gave our life to Christ and we became what God had already ordained for us to become. Now, we hear that term, the gospel. Somebody say the gospel. You may ask yourself, what does that mean? I think this is very important to define. The gospel means good news. And the good news is that God came in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, to become sin and pay the penalty of it and die a death for all of humanity on the cross. Then three days later, rose from the dead, proving he is the son of God and given the name that is above all names. Can we give God some praise for the name that is above all names? Man, I'm thankful for that name because that name is above depression. That name is above suicide. That name is above heaviness. It is at that name. Everything else has to bow down in the name of Jesus. Now, if you want things to bow down in the name of Jesus, you have to surrender all that implies with the G what comes to Jesus. Amen. So anyone who believes in Jesus or calls on the name of Jesus and repents, turn a different direction of their sins, can receive the gift of salvation and inherit eternal life. That is the good news. Now, would you believe or would you agree would be the better word that I want to use that in this world that we live in, there are a lot of good points being made, but instead of giving good points, this world needs good news. Amen. Good points may motivate you. Good points may bring encouragement, but it's the good news that take you from motivation to transformation. It's in the good news that we are not just encouraged. We have the joy of the Lord because my strength is in the joy of the Lord. And the reason why we can have joy because it's something that God gave us. So if God, give, if God has given us something, that means the world can't take it away. External circumstances can't take it away. Heaviness can't take it away. It is my inheritance as a believer who believes in the gospel that joy is part of that gospel package. So now, while the gospel delivers us out of sin into a life of freedom, it also defines what freedom is and what freedom isn't. Now, I love deliverance, and I love deliverance ministries, and there are needed. Deliverance is needed, but the thing about deliverance, it is good to have, but often it's incomplete because deliverance is taking me out of something, and freedom is bringing me into something. Amen? Amen. God has taken us out of death and bringing us into life. He's taken us out of sickness and bringing us into health. He's taken us out of defeat and bringing us into victory. And there is a transition between being delivered, taken out of something, and stepping into something, which is freedom. And the gospel, again, is not just about delivering us, setting us free, but it is about bringing us into a relationship where we constantly stay in freedom through Christ Jesus. Now, we are not free to live however we want. The gospel does not communicate that. Uh, it's important, right? <laughs> Which is how we lived before we knew Christ. But the gospel 
uh, it, it is about God in his word that he set forth paths that he's prearranged, predestined, preorganized that we walk into that brings freedom. So again, the gospel is not about uh, doing whatever we feel. The gospel is about living a life surrendered to Christ. It is no longer I that lives. It is no longer you that lives. It is Christ that liveth in his grace that worketh in me. Can I get an amen? So if we're not experiencing freedom in some areas, it may be you trying to live in an area that Christ needs to live. And two lives can't exist in one body. Either the life of Christ is going to live inside of you, or are you going to do you that's going to live inside of you? This is why Pastor Dean is going to preach on it in the weeks to come. The flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. You can't be in the flesh and in the spirit. You can't do you and do Christ. You have to do Christ and let you die at the cross because it was at the cross that my versions of success, it was at the cross that whatever I want gets nailed and I pick up what Christ wants in me. And can I give you a revelation? What Christ wants is better for you. Christ don't want you in a relationship where you're abused. Christ don't want you in a, in a pattern when you're staying in an addiction. Christ don't want you defeated. And when he offers freedom, he's offering you freedom and he's saying, be obedient to my word. Not because he's some tyrant trying to get you to follow him, but it's because he knows that true freedom is only in his word. And any other path outside of his word is paths that lead to death. This is why one of the most... Uh, Wise books written by one of the most wisest kings talks about there is a way to a man or a woman that seems right, but it leads to death. In other words, if Satan is going to bait you out of freedom into bondage that you thought was freedom, he's going to allure you with good things, but not godly things. Ooh, Jesus. Because there's a difference between having the choice that makes, let me say it this way. There is a difference between having the choice of freedom and making choices that bring freedom. You might have had the choice to do certain things, but did that choice bring back freedom into your life? So Satan loves making what is bondage look like freedom and what freedom looks like bondage. This is how he got us in the garden in Genesis 3. Surely you won't die. He tried to offer self-sufficiency to humanity, and the self-sufficiency that he offered to humanity was actually humanity's end. Once humanity thought they can live or be like God, that's when death started to happen in their life. And what if I told you that God didn't call you to be self-sufficient, independent of him? God wants you to live independence of him, or excuse me, in interdependent with him. Let me say it that way. So freedom is not always what it looks like. There are mirage and illusions of freedom. And if I ask and survey this room or we survey the world, what is freedom? Everyone would have their own definition of what freedom is. So freedom is uh, boundaried and governed by certain things. And, and we see in Galatians chapter 2, Pastor Dean preached on it, verses 1 through 10, that Paul is protecting the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. And, and, and in Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10, what's happening is Paul, excuse me, is being accused of preaching a different gospel. He's accused of preaching a gospel that's palatable to Gentiles, but not favorable to Jews. So he begins to defend his position and why he's preaching what he's preaching. So he goes to the, the Jewish leaders and he shares the revelation that he has. And they agree with him that you are not preaching a different gospel, but you are preaching the right gospel because you're preaching that freedom is not based on works. Freedom is based on faith in Christ Jesus. I don't find freedom by adhering to a bunch of rules and regulations. Now, when you adhere to a bunch of rules and re regulations, it may modify my behavior, but it won't modify my heart. This is why the law didn't work, because the law pointed to us that we were sinners in need of a savior, and the law was perfect, but it was perfect at creating a moral standard, not moral transformation. So when you adhere to the law and you try to keep it and you fell in one, you are deserving of death. This is why Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin and obeyed the law completely and perfectly. He got what we deserve, sin and death, so we can get what he deserved, righteousness and identity and peace with God. Oh, somebody better shout and say amen to that. We serve a God who took on what we deserve so we can get what he deserves. 
Jesus became sin for you and I because he knew that there was no other person, nobody can keep the law. But Jesus, who was sinless and perfect, kept the law, but yet he died as if he didn't. So that we who don't keep the law can live as if we did. Oh, Jesus. My God. My God. So I'm righteous not by my works of the law. I'm righteous by my faith in Christ Jesus, the one who kept the law, the one who was perfect, the one who was sinless. So therefore, when I say I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me, I am identifying that I am putting Christ above my culture. And that's what I want to talk to us today. If you're taking notes, the sermon topic that I'm speaking from is freedom is in Christ, not culture. Freedom is in Christ, not culture. And in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21, we are going to unpack this verse by verse, scripture by scripture. But as I paraphrase before we unpack, Paul is challenging Peter because Peter is no longer eating with Gentiles. Peter is no longer sitting with people who are now a part of the gospel. And Paul is telling Peter and those who follow Peter that you are living in hypocrisy. And then Paul begins to defend why he's telling them they're hypocrites and why he's confronting them. And he's saying that if you are right by, by works of law, then, then Christ's sacrifice was done in vain. He's saying that you are trying to push something that you learned in your culture on another culture. But it's not our culture that got us saved. It was Christ that got us saved. Which means I'm not a black Christian. I'm not an Italian Christian. I am a Christian because I don't, I did, my identity doesn't come from my race. My identity comes from my Savior. Oh, God. My identity doesn't come from my fraternity. My identity doesn't come from my job. My identity doesn't come from my sexual preference. My identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. So there's no such thing as black Christian, white Christian, gay Christian. The moment I say that it is no longer I who lives, but Christ that lives in me, whatever I was before Christ, that has to die once I pick up the name of Christ. Which means you may feel like you're born a certain way. Guess what? Get born again. 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 This is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that although you were born into sin, shaped in iniquity, identified with a culture, you can get born again, come into Christ, and break free from that culture. I'm not bound by my culture. I'm not bound by the traditions of man. I'm not bound by labels. I am defined by my Savior. My freedom is in Christ. Tell your neighbor, your freedom is in Christ. So Galatians is teaching us about gospel clarity because gospel clarity brings gospel unity and gospel unity brings gospel diversity. Why is gospel unity and gospel diversity important? Because gospel clarity helps us know that there's no no longer Jew or Gentile, male or female, Greek or Hebrew, rich or poor. We're all one in Christ. But then, so therefore it brings us into a unified, a spiritual temple, which Christ is our cornerstone. So as we live a unified life, and unity is not the sameness of a person, it's the oneness of a purpose. It's not the sameness of a person, it's the oneness of a purpose. In other words, our unity is not predicated on us being like one another. Our unity is predicated on us having purpose in Christ together with one another. So unity then brings diversity. Diversity is how the gospel no longer was just to the Jews, but it also came to the Gentiles. Why is gospel diversity important? Because without gospel diversity, there won't be gospel expansion. If God only limited the gospel to the Jews, you and I who are Gentiles, I don't know if there's any Jews in here, but if you are, well, God bless you. (laughs) But, But if you're a Gentile, that means we wouldn't have been able to receive the gospel. But, but, but the Jews were kind of like thinking they were superior 
and that Gentiles were inferior. But really, God used the Jews to incubate a nation so that Christ can come out of that nation, so that he can have somebody out of the lineage because he promised Abraham, he promised David that there will always be a seed that will sit on the throne. And that seed was also pointing to the Messiah, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. So now when Jesus came out of a nation that God preserved so that that person, Jesus Christ, who is the son of God, can die for all of humanity. So the Jews were used to bring forth the Messiah. But now that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is here, Jesus is used to reconcile all of humanity back to him. So we get to this place where Paul is challenging Peter because Peter is messing up the gospel unity. Peter is messing up the gospel of diversity and surely he's messing up the gospel from expanding because if you have to be circumcised to be right with God, how many knows you a grown man trying to get circumcised? Hey, let me do that when I'm like uh, one, uh, one day old or something where I'm not gonna remember. I don't wanna do that as a full grown man, right? And they didn't even have sharp objects the way we have now. It was kind of like a rock that wasn't really sharp, so it was going to hurt. <laughs> Nevertheless, Peter was pushing circumcision on the Gentiles. And Paul is saying circumcision is not how we're right with Christ, but it's our faith in Christ. So this is where we're at in this text. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, Paul says, I would stood him to his face. I, I like a person that just tell me, to your, tell me to my face if you got a problem with me. Don't gossip about me. Don't, don't have me guessing if we cool or not. Let me know if you got an issue with me. Anybody like leaders and people like that? So now when Peter had come to Antioch, I would stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Now, this is important. Why was Paul confronting Peter? Number one, Peter's belief in his actions were showing inconsistencies. In modern day terms, he was posting what he wasn't practicing at home. I feel like some of y'all didn't like that one. You posting all that righteousness on Facebook, social media, and TikTok, but are you living what you post? Are you living out what you post, teach, or even what you put as a, as a law in your home? Are you living according to those standards? So he's being confronted. And, and why did Paul care so much about Peter's eating habits? The reason why he cared about his eating habits because it caused racial division and added requirements to the gospel. Eating with Gentiles may seem like a mundane thing to a mundane, excuse me, thing to you and I, but if we can grasp the historical and the biblical background, Jews didn't eat with Gentiles. For religious and racial reasons, both Gentiles and their food were considered unclean. So them ribs that you like to eat, them collard greens that you like to eat, that, that bacon that you like to fry, the Jews wasn't sitting with you. <laughs> because you ate food that was considered unclean to them. But, but, but Peter knew better. Why did he know better? Because in Acts 10 verses 9 through 16, it shows that Peter gets a vision from God. And in his vision, he sees all kind of four-footed animals. And God tells him in the vision, he says, uh, kill and eat. And then Peter responds to God, no, Lord, I won't eat anything unclean. And God responds back to him three different times. Don't call what is clean unclean. Now, what we got to understand is God wasn't merely teaching Paul that he can eat any kind of food per se, but what he was trying to teach Paul was that he can eat with any kind of person. I'm going to say that again. God was not merely teaching Peter that he can eat any kind of food. And we, we can eat whatever we want, right? Because it's not, uh, uh, it's not a part of salvation. But I said to the last service, you may eat whatever you want. You just might get to heaven a little bit faster. You're eating stuff and your, 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 your sugar level is going up. You might, you, you might want to uh, modify some of them eating habits so you can be around for a longer time. Amen? But it wasn't about food as much as it was a metaphor. 
that God is saying that you can eat with any kind of person. Why is this important? Because we don't live a unified, diverse life by observing a few cross-cultural references. We become diverse and we become unified by sitting down and eating with people and sharing our life with one another. Can I get an amen on that? So many significant things has happened in the Bible around food, around going from house to house, from eating, from, from drinking, from, from learning together. So for us, which we do very well as, 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 a, as a body here at Real Life Church, we eat and sit and uh, uh, feast and fellowship with one another. But, but what Peter was doing, he was uh, stopping the gospel from advancing because he was no longer eating with Gentiles because he was afraid that the Judaizers were going to go and report back to Jerusalem that Peter was over there eating with people that he shouldn't eat with. So he cared more about the applause of men than he did the approval of God. I wonder how many of us care more about the applause of men than the approval of God. I wonder how many of us care more about pleasing and appeasing people than to stand for God and the gospel. See, the gospel requires humility because there's going to be some times and some seasons and some situations where you have to stop being so self-focused and got to be gospel focused, where you got to be willing to suffer and be persecuted for the advancement of the gospel. There are going to be settings where you're going to have to speak up. There are going to be moments where you're going to have to not agree with something. There are going to be moments where you're going to have to love somebody but not approve of somebody. Can I get a Hello. Because I'm sure God loves Peter, as we know he loves Peter, but there's a grace that came on Paul to confront Peter, which means God can love you and still not approve of you. My parents need to say A to the man on that one. How many of y'all got kids in here? You ain't going to approve every behavior, nor should you approve of every behavior. But we can love our kids and not approve of them. But the world wants something different. Now, while religion says uh, uh, you got to follow rules to be right with God, the world says since I'm free in God, I can do whatever feels right to myself. And religion often gave us truth but no love. So now the world is offering their versions of love with no truth. So it is very imperative that we don't approve everything that's happening in the world. It's very imperative to the gospel because some of the things that's happening in the world is stopping gospel unity and is stopping gospel diversity. Therefore, it's stopping gospel expansion. Can I get an amen? So um, God, as I mentioned, God wasn't really teaching Peter that he could eat any kind of food, but he, that he could eat with any kind of person. And we know Peter knew better. Why? Because in Acts 10, verses 44 through 46, Peter invites a Roman soldier into his home because God told him to let him in his home. And this was a Gentile because a part of God's dream to Peter in the metaphor is that you can eat anything. It was letting him know that I'm about to send a Gentile your way and you need to let them in your house and eat with them. And as he was eating with this Roman soldier, he, he began to share the gospel. And the Bible says, as he was preaching without even laying hands, the Holy Spirit came on them. And then Peter said to himself, I perceive that God is not a God of partiality, but that God is, is uh, he doesn't favor no one, but uh, the gospel is open to anyone who repents and wants to work righteousness. So Peter knew better. Tell your neighbor, Peter knew better. Take a deep breath. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Breathe in, breathe out. Now, Peter walked with Jesus 24-7, three years straight. Peter walked on water. He did great miracles by the hand of God. He was powerful. He was an apostle. He was a demon-rebuking, tongue-talking, spirit-filled believer, but he still had racism in his heart. Which means you and I can be a tongue-talking, spirit-filled believer and still have racist or discriminatory ways in our heart. Now, I know you may not agree with me, but let me break it down real quick. There is a difference between prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Prejudice is prejudging someone's age, color, gender based on my opinion without having any information to validate that opinion. 
Discrimination is prejudice in action. Because I have an opinion about you and I didn't even get to know you, I'm going to block, I'm going to stop you from having certain uh, favor or stop you from doing certain things. It's discriminatory behavior because I prejudged you. And racism is when you think one race is more superior and another is inferior. Now, the way I read the text, he wasn't eating with Gentiles and he stayed with his Jews. In other words, he felt that the Jewish culture was more superior and the Gentile culture is inferior. Now, before you like, dang, man, how, how can someone stay saved? Even Peter messed up. The same grace that came on Paul to confront Peter was the same grace that gave Peter the identity, the apostleship. In other words, God will still use you if you messed up. Somebody say amen to that. Now, just because you messed up don't mean you stay messed up. God is not for staying messed up. In fact, he sent his gospel to you. He gave you identity. He gave you title. He gave you sonship. He gave you daughtership. He gave you all those things so that you can now change from the inside out because the law was written on stone tablets, but the, the grace of God is now written on our hearts. So God knew you couldn't change those discriminatory, discriminatory ways. God knew you couldn't change that racism. God knew you couldn't change the nasty ways that you have unless a greater one who lives on the inside of us us, can help us from the enemy on the outside of us. That's why we say greater is he that is on the inside of me than he that is in the world. Because change can't happen from the outside in. It has to happen from the inside out. Aren't you so glad that God's word says his gifts and his callings are without repentance? You can't mess your calling up. Now, you may prohibit it. You may stop it. But if God calls you a son, if God calls you a daughter, if God calls you a pastor, if God calls you a teacher, if God calls you an entrepreneur, if God calls you a philanthropist, if God calls you whatever it is he calls you, no one can undo what the Lord has already called and ordained for you to do. But you can stop it. You can undo it from not surrendering and submitting to the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind, it's, it's, it's a renewal process. And, and why is the mind important? Because uh, as human beings, we're, we're tripart beings. We have a spirit that's in connection to God. We are a soul, a mind, will, and emotion, and personalities, which is connected to ourselves. And we have a body that's connected to the world. And God needs to connect us to him, the spirit, and the Bible says that the words I speak are spirit and life. In other words, it's the word of God that can do things in your spirit, which can help renew your soul, which can change your behavior. Oh, y'all missed it. So I am a spirit. I possess a soul and I live in the body. Now, before I was born again, I, my spirit was dormant and I just had soul and body experience. In other words, I did whatever I experienced. I did whatever culture taught me because I didn't have something bigger and greater than me to teach me otherwise. So in other words, your behavior, your decisions was based on your experiences, based on how you were brought up because those are all soulish experiences. But when you come into Christ, you get born again. You get a new nature. You now have a spirit that can connect and communicate with God. So every time I read the word of God, it's speaking identity. It's speaking righteousness. It's speaking joy. It's speaking peace. It's speaking the love of God. It's speaking to me that I deserve better. No, you don't need to keep going back to that. You don't need to keep going back to bondage. You don't need to keep going back to death. It's speaking to the me I'm becoming, not the me I once was. And if I can renew my mind to what God has already declared over me, then I now bring that into my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotion. And once the soul of a man and the spirit of a man is in connection to God and in agreement, it can now start telling the body what to do. This is why if you were promiscuous, you don't got to be promiscuous anymore. Because if you take your soul and you renew it to the word of God and those two things are in agreement, it can start prophesying. You are better than this. You, you, you don't got to keep laying down. You don't got to keep having sex to find fulfillment. My fulfillment is in Christ Jesus. The Lord can start speaking to you, which was a generation curse. It is now broken. But the curses that are broken, they seem like they're not broken because it's not a generation curse. It's more of a generation mindset. Because in Christ Jesus, are you really cursed? 
In Galatians, we read that I am redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm redeemed from death. I'm redeemed from sickness and I'm redeemed from poverty. So if Christ calls me redeemed, I'm redeemed. If Christ says I'm free from the curse, I'm free from the curse. So it's not a spirit issue, it's a generational mindset issue. So until I change my mindset, I keep going back to bondage, although the Lord has already set me free. So God has set me free, but because I don't know the importance of renewing my mind, I keep going back to bondage. And when you have seasons in your life where you face pain, grief, heartache, pain, and the avoidance of it is always bait to go back to your bondage because it's familiar, it's comfortable. Freedom is always calling you out of something. Freedom is always saying, hey, this is uncomfortable, but this is, this is new rhythms. Freedoms have rhythms. Freedom, it, it has a rhythm to it. Bondage doesn't have a rhythm. It's just do whatever you feel like doing, and you're gonna automatically land in bondage. But, but, but freedom has the rhythm of self-control. Freedom has the rhythm of yielding to Christ. Freedom has the rhythm of it's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives inside of me. And many people are trying to do the dance of freedom, but they're still dancing in bondage. It's because you have not learned the rhythms of freedom. The rhythm of freedom is not you doing you. The rhythm of freedom is you dying to you and doing more of Christ so Christ can show you a new dance. Can I prophesy over somebody here today the Lord is going to give you a new dance you're not going to dance with bondage no more you're not going to dance with sickness no more you're not going to dance with disease no more you're not going to dance with bad relationships no more you're going to dance with Jesus Christ because now he's giving you the garment of praise he's giving you beauty instead of ashes and joy instead of mourning and if I got anybody in agreement I need you to erupt with praise right now go ahead and give the Lord a shout let's praise his name I don't got to dance with death no more. I don't got to dance with lies no more. I don't got to dance with generation curse no more. I can dance with the author, the finisher of my faith, and I can walk in healing. I can dance my way to peace. I can dance my way to joy. I can dance my way to breakthrough. Galatians 2, 13 and 14, Paul is challenging Peter because he says, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, in other words, this public sin needed to be publicly addressed because it was a social contagion. It was something that was limiting the gospel. Peter's uh, stance against the Gentiles because they were not circumcised, it started to affect other believers. Your hypocrisy will affect other believers. Your hypocrisy will affect your kids in your home. Your legalism will affect your staff. All of that. If you don't change your heart and you don't change the, the, the posture of hypocrisy to humility, you will start setting a precedent in your home and your business that nobody can keep. And that's what it's called legalism. Somebody say legalism. Let me give you these real quick. Hindrances, hindrances to freedom. Number one is putting our culture above Christ. Number two, a hindrance to freedom is hypocrisy. Somebody say hypocrisy. That word hypocrisy means in a concordance, an actor under an assumed character, deceitful. And I like this quote that Pastor Dean gave me in our sermon prep. The hypocrite does not merely tell lies with his mouth. He tells lies with his life. In Galatians 2, 15 through 17, it says, We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of law. For by the works of the law, no flesh should be justified. But if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, are we found sinners? Therefore, is Christ a minister of sin? Certainly not. Paul is saying that if we as Jews, because he's, he's a Jewish leader, have found righteousness in Christ Jesus by faith, and therefore we are now pushing to Gentiles that they have to be circumcised, although we are not following all the things that we're supposed to do. Is now Christ leading us to sin because you're calling this a sin? He says, certainly not. Because Christ is not the minister of sin. He is the minister of righteousness. 
So legalism is one of the ways that will prohibit the gospel from going forth. Legalism says uh, uh, you have to focus on the outside and what others can see while you neglect the inside what only God can see. Ooh, Jesus. Legalism is focusing on the outside what others can see while you're neglecting the inside what only God can see. Legalism may modify behavior but does not transform hearts. The cross is not merely a historical event. It affects our contemporary life as well, our social and our uh, racial relationships. Because at the cross, somebody say at the cross. At the cross, it is where my versions of success dies and I pick up the life that Christ has for me. At the cross was when me being a real estate agent and a club promoter died and I picked up me being a pastor, a leader, a faithful man of God. It's at the cross where your versions of success, your versions of what relationships will look like. It's at the cross where you gotta say, I am nailing this to the cross and I'm I'm gonna find success, I'm gonna find life, and I'm gonna find healing in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ and I'm here to tell you today God has an abundant life for you and I to live and it won't come from us doing us it's gonna come from us yielding to him my final and last point is that a hindrance to freedom is when we frustrate the grace of God God's grace has already done what it needed to do you are healed by faith You are free by faith. You are married by faith. If you spend time with God's word and he's giving you desires that line up with his word, that desire because you delighted in him, he will bring it to pass by faith. I'm not saying you got to name it, claim it. I'm saying when I spend time with his word, when I spend time with the gospel of Jesus Christ and it has taken over my heart and from that place of surrender, desires are arising, desires are coming up. Those are God ordained desires that you need to start speaking over yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen. When we frustrate the grace of God, it's us trying to do what's done. It's us trying to make happen what has already happened. It's us trying to become what the gospel already declares you already are. The gospel and the grace of God is not just here to set you free. It's not just here to help you live free, but it wants you to stay free. God doesn't want us to go back to Egypt. God doesn't want us to go back to bondage. God doesn't want us to go back to brokenness. God doesn't want us to be baited back to bondage because we're afraid to face pain. It's in the facing of pain that God will give you purpose in that pain. It's in facing mess. God will give you a message out of that mess. It was in my pain. It was in my mess that I said, I don't feel like facing this. It is too unbearable to face. But when I faced it with Christ, when I faced it with community, when I faced it with the word of God, every pain, every mess, the Lord turned beauty instead of ashes. The Lord began to be my potter and I was his clay. It is amazing what the Lord can do when you give the broken pieces of your life back to the potter. He can shape and make it whole. He can make all things work for the good of those who love him. When you give God some praise, go ahead and give him some praise right now. Oh, I feel somebody need a breakthrough. I feel somebody believing that you are no longer going to be the same. God wants you free. He wants you to stay free and he wants you to live free. How do we stay in freedom? John 8, 31 through 32. And then Jesus said to the, those who, who were Jews who believed him, if you abide, somebody say abide. abide, make permanent resident, it's to live in and allow him to live in you. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You are free. You are free, but you need the word living in your heart to activate that freedom. You need healing, you got to get in the word. I I, I remember I had different challenges coming against me and I got all the scriptures on healing and I began to declare healing over myself because there's freedom in healing and the word of God was sent so that it can heal us of all our challenges. When I needed provision, I got a bunch of word on the provision of the Lord and I began to confess and declare that over myself. And when I needed God to be my advocate, when I needed God to be my lawyer, when I needed God to bring justice, I began to renew my mind to the just God that he was and the Lord began to right out wrongs. The Lord began to intervene in areas that man couldn't help me in that only the Lord can help me in. Freedom is in an abiding relationship with Jesus. 
it's not complicated. Oh, Jesus. Freedom is not complicated. It's just costly. My God. It's not complicated. It's just costly. It may cost you that relationship. It may cost you that habit. It may cost you something that you don't want to give up. This is what we're going to learn throughout Galatians, that I can't give into my flesh that what I want in order for the spirit to live. I have to give up that what I want so that the spirit of God can flow freely in my life. Freedom, healing, breakthrough. It's not complicated. It's just costly. Are you willing to give up your version of success? Are you willing to lay down that sinful relationship? Are you willing to give up that addiction? Are you willing to give up those habits? If you are willing to give those things up, freedom and breakthrough is promised to us. So freedom is not just a one-time choice in a relationship where we make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Freedom is in the consistent choice of choosing Jesus above everything else. In this culture... You're going to have so many different options and allurements and mirages that look like freedom that are going to be good, but not God. And we can repeat what happened in the garden. One man, Adam, sin got us kicked out of the garden. Oh God, I feel heaven on this. But another man's righteousness and his obedience brought us back into the garden. We was kicked out of the garden through Adam, but we are now back in the garden through Jesus. We was kicked out of the presence of God through Adam, but now there is no separation. The wall, the veil is ripped, and we have full access. Access is fully granted in Christ Jesus. So Satan's strategy is to try to get you to forfeit the access that you've been given in God's presence by being a Lord through good. And I'm not talking about all good things are bad. I'm talking about good that takes us away from God. As Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to a man, meaning good, but it leads to death. If we are not living in an obedient life, surrender to Christ daily, not weekly, not monthly, daily where we choose Jesus above everything else, we could be like Peter and we can allow things to come into our hearts that shouldn't be in our hearts. This is why God says, above all else, Guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. So I want to conclude as we stand to our feet. We should all walk away knowing that freedom is in a phrase. And this is what freedom is. I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's where freedom is. Because if it's Christ who lives in me and no longer I, this freedom comes above my culture This freedom comes against whatever is in opposition to my freedom in Christ Jesus. And if you're in here today and there's some things that you need to be set free from, there's some things that you feel like God is calling you out so that you can step into, I want to pray with you and for you. I believe that the Lord has declared you righteous. The Lord has declared freedom over your life. But just because he declared it don't mean that you're not in position to step into it. And freedom is going to require us to lay down whatever we think success is, and pick up God's version for it. If you're in here today and you're like, Pastor Damon, that's me. I need some breakthrough. I need some freedom in in some areas of my life. Just lift up your hands. I want to pray with you and for you. I see hands all around the atmosphere. I want to ask you to do something for me real quick. All those who raise your hand, this is the last service, so we go in a little bit. I want you to come to the front right now. Come on, come to the front. Come to the front. Anybody else out there, you are tired of just being delivered, and now you want to step into freedom. God doesn't just want you delivered from sin. He wants you translated. He wants you transformed into a life of freedom. Let's fill it up right here. Come on, fill it in, fill it in. And what I want you to do right now while you're at the altar, I just want you to lift up your hands. What does this mean? This is a sign of surrender. Let's fill it in. We, We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're united. We're diversified. Let's embrace this gospel unity and this gospel diversity. And Pastor Brandon is going to go back into that song, New Wine. Because I want to prophesy over you. If you're ready to change your mind, which means you are new wineskin, the Lord can now pour new wine into your life. God can't pour new wine into an old wineskin. But if we come to this altar where we can be altered, where we can be changed, and we're saying, God, I no longer want to live, but I want you to live inside of me. As we begin to lift up our hands and and begin to challenge the way we think and say, God, I'm going to put that to the cross. I'm going to nail that to the cross. What you allow is the spirit of life to begin to flow in and through you. So right now, let's just lift up our hands. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every believer, every non-believer who is at this altar. God, I prophesy that as they are having hands raised, you will bring new wine to their marriage, new wine to their relationships, new wine to their lives. Father, I thank you that you're bringing them out of bondage into freedom. You're bringing them out of darkness into light. You're bringing them out of, out of defeat into victory. You're bringing them out of whatever it is that they were in. And this today will be a prophetic day where they no longer stayed in Egypt or the wilderness. They are now stepping into their promised land. And if I got anybody in agreement, at the altar and in the audience. I need you to give God some praise. Thank you again for joining us. We pray that message ministered to your heart and lifted your spirit today. Hey, to find out more about joining the RLC online family, you can find us on the Church Center app. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. God bless you.